These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. Well, uh, so to start with, the, the key to dealing with rotation is to try to see as many analogies as possible with regular translational motion. So there's two different types of motion. There's translational motion, which is just when something is going from one place to another. So like now the chalk holder is going through translational motion, or now it's going through translational motion. Sometimes that's called linear motion. And then the other type of motion is rotational, and that's pretty self-explanatory. So now the chalk is going through rotational motion. Of course, the hardest problem is you could be doing both. Right now, the chalk is both moving and rotating. Well, in the first part of the course, you learned how to deal with translational or linear movement. And what I was saying is, the key, one of the keys to dealing with rotational motion is to see how it's analogous to the translational motion. We want to see as many analogies as possible. So starting with kinematics, in kinematics, there's basically five variables that you use for solving problems. V initial, V final, acceleration, time, and displacement. Those are your basic variables. Oftentimes, you'd have to break things into components. So I, maybe I should have written V initial x, V final x, and A sub x, since I used delta x. But these are the general variables. Let's actually review that a little bit. So, um, well, let's start with this again. Or let's see which one is the best to start with. Maybe we'll start with this. So what, what is the, the name of this concept again? Um, displacement. That's right. This is our displacement. And what are the standard SI units for displacement? Just meters. Right. Now we have to remember what is the analogous concept for rotational movement. This is one of the hardest ones for students to remember. Most students don't remember what rotational displacement is. Do you have any idea what that would be? What symbol you would use for that? I don't. That's one of the hardest ones for people to remember. But if you think about it, the way to figure out, the way to measure how much something has rotated is to say what angle it's rotated through. Okay. If you say what angle something has rotated through, you've really, in a sense, said what distance it's rotated through. So the analogous concept would be delta theta. And the name of this concept is the angular displacement. Right. So I'll put it underneath. And it's crucial to know the units for every concept we come across. Well, what would be a logical standard unit to use for an angular displacement? How do we measure an angle? Sorry? Degrees. Degrees is oftentimes used. What's another unit that we might um, use for angles? Radians. That's right. Radians are the SI, standard unit. So we'll call this concept as being in radians. Well, time is the easy one, because the time is the same variable in rotation or not in rotation. What, what's the units for time, the SI Seconds. unit? Seconds. That's right. Well, here's another one that students oftentimes forget. Uh, well, first of all, what does V stand for? Velocity. Now, remember what the unit is for that. Uh, meters per second. Good. But how about rotational velocity? Um, Any idea what our symbol might be for that? Radians per second? That would be a good units. Good. That's very logical because that's going to tell us how the angular displacement is changing in time. We still have to say what symbol we're going to be using for angular velocity. How do you remember what that is? R. R. Now, R is generally going to be used for a radius or a distance. Okay. Now, the symbol we're going to use here, you'll probably recognize it when I put it on the board, is omega. Yeah. You've seen that in class? Okay. Now, this looks like a W, but it's actually the Greek letter omega. And it corresponds to the velocity here. This is a little confusing because this is used for two different concepts, this term. It's used for angular velocity, and it's used for angular frequency. When you're dealing with rotation, we call this the angular velocity. And when you're dealing with oscillations, perhaps you remember that this is called the angular frequency. You might have seen in that other video series this equation for relating omega and f. 
All right, so I just wanted to mention that it stands for two different concepts. But that was not a mistake on the part of, uh, on the, part of the physicists. It's a good idea to use the same symbol for both of those because they're very analogous concepts. A lot of the things that work for angular velocity also work for angular frequency, even though they're different things. That's a little bit of a detour. We're not working on oscillations right this second. So right now we're going to call this the angular velocity. This is the translational velocity, and this is the angular velocity. But some of the things we say about angular velocity will turn out to be true for angular frequency when you deal with oscillations as well. For example, that's also in radians per second. Well, there would be omega initial and omega final. Finally, what does this symbol stand for? Um, acceleration. That's right. That's our linear acceleration. It says the most complicated units. What are the units for the acceleration? Meters per second squared. It's good that you know that. Well, we got one more Greek letter to put in here. This one's a little bit easier. We need the Greek analogy for an A. Do you know what the Greek letter A is? Alpha. There you go. That's where the word alphabet comes from, um, because I have the letter A in the Greek alphabet is alpha. I think this is easier to remember because it looks like an A. This one's the one that's a little bit trickier. Sometimes students get these two things confused, so we don't want to do that. Now we should be able to figure out what a logical unit is for alpha based on the other units we've used. Radians per second squared. Right. Well, this might seem trivial, but the, the key to getting started on this is just knowing what the concepts are and knowing what their symbols are and knowing what their units are. You can't uh, even get started learning the problem solving techniques until you're very clear on these ideas. Incidentally, on your exams, uh, do you get to use a notes or a cheat sheet, or is it closed He book? gives us formulas. He'll give you formulas, but you can't bring your own. Right. OK. Well, the kind of stuff I have on the board, your instructor probably thinks is too basic to give you. So this is stuff that you need to make flashcards of and memorize ahead of time. This is stuff that you want to be able to think, uh, retrieve from your mind after one second. This should be the easy stuff. Uh, of course, uh, both of these have the same units. Very well, then these are our equation, these are our variables. So these are the rotational kinematics variables. There's five rotational kinematics variables, just like there's five for translational kinematics. One thing that's going to be a little bit simpler for rotation is that you're not going to have to break these into components. I mentioned a second ago that when you're doing translational motion, you actually have to work with the x components and the y components separately but you're not going to have to do that with rotation, so we don't need to put in uh, x's and y's down here. We'll just have one version of rotation. Now, there's five variables, and there's also five kinematics equations. Maybe those are things he's actually going to give you. It sounds like the equations are the types of things that they would likely give you on the test. Um, however, let me just uh, to give you an example. Maybe the most basic equation is one of the very basic equations for linear kinematics. Well, what would be the rotational version of this? Um, omega final mm -hmm. equals omega initial plus alpha times time. Good. So if you did happen to have the translational equations memorized, you wouldn't have to memorize anything new for rotation. They're all just analogies of each other. This is another linear kinematics equation. What would be the rotational analogy to that? Um, delta theta equals omega initial plus omega final over two. Good. And again, the one that's hardest for students to remember is that the analog for displacement is angular displacement. All right, well, rather than waste time putting all those on the board, um, here's a handout that I have that yeah. summarizes these. So let's see, we're looking at the rotation handout with the kinematics variables. So here at the top, you can see we've laid out the linear and rotational kinematics variables. Mm -hmm. And then on the left-hand side, I've got the linear or translational mm -hmm. equations. And here we have the rotational equations. Okay. All right. Okay. 
Uh, and yeah, that's for you to keep. Now, um, you, your instructor is going to give you these equations on the test, although it might, uh, he might not be giving them to you in the most useful form. For example, many instructors don't include this equation, which I find very helpful. So um, you can look at, uh, you, you might uh, want to memorize one or two of those that your instructor isn't going to, to give you there. 